We're moving on to a very interesting and very practical chapter. Linda Hill, I put the link from Harvard University. Um, now, Linda Hill is one of the speakers that I'd like to have a teleconference with. So if anybody wants to work on a project of contacting Linda Hill and trying to set up a teleconference, that would be interesting. So far in this class, we've had teleconferences with Philip Zimbardo, that was really fun, a couple of years ago, and with, two years ago, and with Kirk Hansen. That was a year and a half ago as well. I think Zimbardo was three years ago and Hansen was two years ago. So if somebody wants to uh, contact Linda Hill and try to set up a teleconference with her this semester, uh, that would be a great project for extra credit for one or two people. The second thing I'd like to recommend, if someone, can someone be in charge of setting up a WhatsApp group for this class? 50? Well, well, I'm sure that not all 50, not all 60 are, are going to want to be part of it. So, uh, so if, who, can someone come to me after class and say I'm responsible for social media after, cla after class? I'm responsible for social media. I don't, by, the, by the way, guys, I don't use WhatsApp. Because I have a 12-year-old mobile phone. Yes, uh, there's, a mo there's a James Bond movie where he had it in his pocket and the, stopped the bullet, right? Yeah, OK, that's a joke. OK, so uh, I, hope, I hope to live a long life and never, ever to text in my life. And I'll tell you why later. OK, good. Take out your reader and turn to so Linda Hill. Why would we need the group? Because I'm, I will send the social media person messages, and that person will put it on WhatsApp. I'm not totally a Luddite, obviously, because I do, as you probably noticed, use Facebook. So, but I have my limits. OK, so. This will be an opportunity for you to communicate during my absence. During my absence, because unfortunately, on Thursday, I'm sorry to say, I'm going on a hike to Turkey again uh, with a group of Armenians. Uh, so we won't have class on Thursday, but we will have we will have to be working. So I would recommend that all of you get on the Facebook group or the WhatsApp group or use your Blackboard. So we will be going to a place called Musa Dek. In Turkish, in uh, Armenian, it's called Musa Ler. In Turkish, in um, Arabic, it's Jebel Musa or Mount Moses. It's beside the historical Christian town of Antioch. You all know where that is. Yeah. It's right on the Turkish-Syrian border. It's a very old Christian town. It's mentioned in the Bible many times. And uh, this is a famous mountain where, the, during the genocide, the Armenians actually <laughs> defeated the Ottoman armies over a period of 56, year, 56 days. This is a famous novel, and every year we go hiking up this mountain, and we're going to turn it into a GIS-based virtual museum by 2019. So if you're interested in GIS, NDU is, by the way, the only university in the country that offers a degree in GIS. And I know the director of the GeoConsult International, which hire, he hires every single NDU graduate as they come off the line. Uh, basically, if you study GIS, you have a guaranteed job with Global Consult, uh, with GeoConsult International in Beirut. Uh, he, he can't get enough of them. He says, oh, you're from NDU? What? His, his child and my child go to the same school. And when he said, oh, you're from NDU, he just started raving about how wonderful we are and the GIS graduates from our university. So we're going to be doing, with the support of GeoConsult International and others, a virtual museum over the next couple of years. That's why I'm not going to be here. So we were going to have a virtual classroom. Yes, that's what we're going to do. So the person who's going to do the WhatsApp should contact me today right after class, and we will be taking the show on the road, so to speak. So Linda Hill. Linda Hill 
is, I would say, the most practical, hands-on of all the authors in this reader. She gives examples from Italy and from South Africa of ethical business leaders who were able to resist a lot of pressure. The one that you already know is, which Italian business leader are you aware of already? Franco Bernabe. Now Franco Bernabe, the reason I introduced him earlier on is because he uses a method which is also found in other um, leadership skill approaches or skill sets. What does he use? Solitudine or quiet in, in Italian. He spends uh, about a half an hour every day quietly reflecting on the day. What are the other examples that we've had from other leaders? Martin Luther King Jr. And it's, he calls it self-purification. Remember the four steps. Who else? Initiatives of change, quiet time. And Dag Hammarskjöld, inner dialogue. And, and there are many others. I just chose four for this class. This is one of the common denominators. One of the things that leadership training programs have in common is this idea that you need time every day on a regular basis to step out of the day and think through it, to get out of the pressure and the rush of the logic of your leadership positions, which of course is relevant for everybody, not just leaders. Okay. Barnabe comes from a town called Stetzing. Now, this is not in the book, but it is on Wikipedia if you're interested. Stetzing is a town in Italy call, uh, in a region called South Tyrol. South Tyrol, does anybody know where Tyrol is? No skiers? To, anybody heard of Innsbruck? No? No skiers. Okay, no skiers in the room? Really? Okay, uh, Innsbruck is in, uh, is Austria is sort of like a, shaped like a guitar, if you will, and the, the arm of the guitar, or the neck of the guitar, is a long strip that separates Germany from Italy, and towards the end of that we have Innsbruck, which is one of the most important skiing centers in the Austrian Alps, and south of that, we have the part of Tyrol, which is now controlled by Italy. It was conquered from the Austrians in World War I. What happened after World War I is that for the first couple of years, Italy remained a monarchy, and then it was turned into a fascist dictatorship. By whom? Mussolini. Mussolini. And Mussolini banned the German language. Not only that, he did something that later on the Israelis uh, and the Israelis did, and before him, the British. And why are there so many Protestants in Northern Ireland? Does anyone know? They were settled there by the British in order to dilute the Catholic population. Why are there so many Jews on the West Bank? They were settled there by Sharon in order to do what? The loot the Arab population. And Mussolini did the same thing in South Tyrol. He brought in a lot of Italians to this German-speaking part that he had conquered. And he also gave each town a Italian name. So Stetzing, which is the name of the town for the last 2,000 years, or 1,000 years at least, was given the name Vipiteno. Vipiteno. Stetzing, and this is where Franco Bonarbe grew up. An Italian living under the conditions of settlement. It's like the Jews in the West Bank. Do the Jews in the West Bank feel welcome? No, they shouldn't be, they're not. Uh, do the Protestants in Northern Ireland feel welcome? No. And the Italians living in South Tyrol don't feel welcome either. So, Franco Bernabe, obviously being an Italian, in a hostile environment, growing up with Germans who didn't want the Italians there. 
So, does this make your life as a young person pleasant or unpleasant? Unpleasant. unpleasant. You're going to notice that one of the um, elements or one of the key uh, attributes of a successful leader, according to uh, Linda Hill, is growing up and experiencing unpleasantness. And she basically says, if your life is not unpleasant, go make it unpleasant. Why would you do that to yourself? You read the chapter. Why would you go out and make your life unpleasant? Everybody knows the saying, what? Right. To exercise moral courage, you have to be confronted with challenges. And if you're not confronted with challenges, what do you do? You're in the flow of success. Thank you. Someone's done their homework. Uh, and so if you want to not be confronted with the flow of success, what do you do? Well, if you want to get out of this easy life, put yourself in the line of fire. If you want, for those of you who are in the sciences or in engineering, what are the two ways of doing empirical research? Observation and experimentation. Why do we do experiments? Why don't we just do observation? You ha why don't we just wait for things to happen? Maybe they never will. Maybe we're not in an environment where this is going to happen. Experiments are artificial settings, right? Yes. You go to the laboratory, you go to a, uh, uh, for example, if, we, if you look at the Stanford prison experiment, in the basement of the psychology department, you set up a prison. It's not a real prison. Experiments are set up to do things that you wouldn't normally do in life. So. If your life is easy, what does Linda Hill recommend that you do? Go out and make it difficult. So, if you look at his, the life of Franco Barnabe, he grew up in a situation which was not pleasant. This is not in the reading, by the way. It's just in my, it's a, pay attention. This is going to be on the test. Uh, what was the conflict he was experiencing? What, what, what was the problem in his town? It was a hostile environment. What kind of hostile environment was it? Was it bad weather? Between the two cultural groups, the two language groups. In Europe, conflicts between language groups are more common than conflicts between religious groups. There's two reasons for that. One is that conflicts between religious groups are not that important anymore because religion is not that important anymore. Language will always be important. You grow up speaking your mother tongue, the language of your family, but many people in Europe are now growing up in a non-religious environment. Religion is not available to them as children. Their parents do not teach them religion, so they don't think that's important. Religion remains important when it's linked to something that gives you access to resources. For example, the conflict in Northern Ireland is not about a religion, it's about the, the English conquering Ireland bringing in Scottish settlers and giving the Protestant Scottish settlers all the rights and privileges and giving the Catholic Irish nothing. So it's not about Catholic versus Protestant, it's about using religion to privilege or discriminate against groups. In South Tyrol it's only about language because the entire population is Catholic. So religion does not play a role even if you wanted it to. Uh, how about in, let's say, take another example, Quebec, in Canada. Language. It's language, but it's also religion. The British are primarily Protestant. The Quebecois, the French, are primarily Catholic. How many, 
times in the last decade or two did you hear about a religious conflict in Canada between the Catholics and the Protestants? No. It's not. It's, it's, it's language. We could make it a religious conflict if we want, but it's not naturally one. How about Yugoslavia? Religion. It's religion, but it's not really religion. It's about the three ethnic groups in Bosnia and Serbia, the Serbs who are Orthodox, the Croatians who are Catholic, and the Bosniaks who are Sunni. But it's not really about religion as much as it is about distribution of power and resources. Anyway, so he grows up in this cultural conflict. What does Linda Hill, which, which term does Linda Hill use with relation to conflicts and culture in the reading, for those of you who've done your homework? When you have cultures intersecting, or cross-cultural, okay, cross-cultural. Cross-cultural means that you have people moving between two cultures. This is one of the great things about Lebanon. You grow up in a cross-cultural setting. One of the things that I've never heard in Lebanon as a foreigner so far is you know what you're doing the way you're doing that we don't do it that way I've never heard this in 15 years because there's at least 18 ways of doing it and nobody can claim for themselves that the way we do it is the way people do it in Lebanon how do you know how the Druze do it in Baklin how do, well, whatever right how do you know what the Shia do it in um, in uh, Nabatia. How do you know? <laughs> you don't know. So if I go claim that I was in the Shuf and I did, it, did something this way, you, unless you're familiar with the Shuf, you have no way of checking to see if it's true or not. This is the advantage of a, cult a cross-cultural setting. Cross-cultural settings can lead to conflicts. They can lead to conf military conflicts. They can lead to conflicts with respect to resource distribution, but they can, ideological, whatever, religious. We know that, for example, Islam and Christianity are, are, are Islam and Christianity universalist or relativist religions? Universalist. universalist. So if they're both universalist and they contradict each other, they basically cancel each other out. There are things about Christianity which are unacceptable to Muslims and vice versa. For Muslims, the, the concept that God has a son is unacceptable. The idea that Jesus is the son of God is seen as contradictory. It's seen as being polytheistic. For Christians, the concept that Muhammad is the prophet of God is seen as being unacceptable. And there are other contradictions as well. So cross-cultural interaction can lead to conflicts. What Linda Hill's talking about is something even more significant, deeper. Cognitive dissonance. What is dissonance? What's the op dissonance is the opposite of harmony. Bravo, you know music. Okay, dissonant music. When you listen to a song with a harmony, if it's a good beat, and it's an, uh, advertisers do this a lot, you can't get the song out of your mind. You keep on singing it, although you don't like the product. You keep on singing the song, because it's so, it's so tough not to, not to forget. Dissonance is the opposite. So a non-harmonic, non-balanced, a disturbing situation, cognitive, Cognition, it, it's about knowing things. So cognitive dissonance means that your learning patterns are all screwed up. So when you're learning things about the world, you're confronted with conflicts, contradictions, which make it difficult to understand how things work. This is good, according to Linda Hill. Why?
Yeah, because this is the way the world is. If you want to be a leader, you will be confronted with cognitive dif dissonance and with cross-cultural cognitive dissonance many times in your life. So it's good to get exposed to that early. The, uh, the other one is significant. What is the other thing that people need to experience? Adversity. Significant adversity. What does Barnabe say about his life? Does anybody, did anybody read that far in the, in the reading? What, did, he, did he experience something that he found very unpleasant, unacceptable? As a young man, you don't remember? As a young man, should this, should, this, should this be the pop quiz today? What was Barnabe's experience with cognitive dissonance and significant, okay. Uh, as a young man, he worked as a volunteer for old people. And you know in Lebanon, when you take this paradigm between group and individual, what is more important? Group. In Europe, it's individual, which means that when parents have children, normally they have to make a calculation. They say, okay, we want a new house, we want a vacation, we want a new car, and we want one or two kids. Let's break it down, right? Now, what can we afford? We have the third kid, we can't buy the car. That's how they do it in many European countries. So when they have their children, they send them to daycare centers. They have the institutions take care of them. And when the parents get old, what do the kids do with their parents? The same thing. Mom and dad, you must like this because you did it to me. And so they put the parents out in some sort of a care home. When you're very poor, the care is very bad. And the parents will not be able to rely on their children for the simple reason that the children couldn't rely on their parents when they were little. So Franco Barnabe is working with old people who are impoverished, and he finds this horrible, the way the Italian society is treating its old people. So this is something that he, sees a, this is, he describes himself. He doesn't talk much about his childhood or youth, but he brings this this key experience up. So he has cross-cultural cognitive dissonance because of his upbringing in a hostile German-speaking environment. He mentions at least uh, this one example of working for impoverished old people as significant adversity, seeing how horrible Italian society is. He then moves on later to take over which company? Any. What is any? It still exists, by the way. For engineers, business students, the largest Italian petrochemical and oil company. It was, as all heavy industry in Italy, up until the 70s and 80s, run by the government. And what you should know about Italy, and we'll be talking about South Africa as well, and I'll give you a little bit of background for South Africa so you can understand where they're coming from. In Italy, in 1945, Mussolini is defeated. He's executed by his own people in a very brutal way, by the way. Uh, the majority of the resistance against the fascists not all of it, by far, but the majority was carried out by the communists. And they had very, very effective military units. The Italian resistance, the militia of the, the communist militia was very strong. And so when Italy is liberated by the Americans, the Americans are not that happy about the fact that the most powerful force in Italy was the communists. Because the communists are allied with whom? With the Soviet Union. And by 47, 48, the Cold War begins, and the Soviets are the bitter enemies of the United States. And so when you find a huge communist party in a country like Italy, or a huge communist party in a country like France, this is seen as being very dangerous by the United States. So what the United States does is to make sure that the communists never come to power. And they put all of their influence behind the Christian Democratic Party which stays in power for almost 40 years. 
Now, a party that's in power for 40 years tends to be, to, tends to be what? Very corrupt. Very corrupt. Because there's no competition. If you add to the equation the fact that all of the heavy industry is owned by the government, <laughs> figure that one out. It's like the EDL, but it's the entire country. <laughs> Imagine all of the factories in Lebanon were run by the government. Yeah, OK, you can figure it out. So that was the situation in Italy. And then in the 80s and 90s, they start to privatize. And when Franco Barnabi comes in, to any, it's in this phase of privatization. And he discovers a company that is incredibly corrupt, and he decides to do something about it as the, as the boss. So is he a whistleblower? He can't be. You can only blow the whistle someone who's on your level or above. But if you're the boss, if you're the CEO, you can't be a whistleblower. What he, what he starts doing now is investigating and exposing the layers and layers of corruption in the company, and many people are arrested and go to jail. So if you were one of those people who was threatened by the boss uh, and you might go to jail, what would you do before that happens? Yeah, you find something bad about him. You counterattack. And from the reading, what happens? Anybody get that far? If he's not guilty of any crimes, if he's not guilty of corruption, what do you do? You make something up. <laughs> you, 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 you forge information and accuse him of corruption. And the case against him was so strong that he says even his mother wasn't sure anymore whether he was a criminal or not. So it's a little bit like a whistleblower situation where his character is being attacked to the extent that even his own family, his mom, you know, an Italian mama, you know, that's, if you lose your mama in Italy, it's not, not a pleasant situation. So he's really, really under a lot of pressure. What gave him the fortitude, the strength to survive? Two things. Did he grow up in the flow of success? No. He grew up confronted with cross-cultural cognitive dissonance and significant adversity. He had to learn very early on to deal with hard situations. So when this really horrible situation hit him, he goes, oh, been there, done that. This is much worse than anything he experienced up until then, but it's not new. So I remember when I was working in various NGOs, I've, you, you, you all have to go see Greco's train exhibit. <laughs> Greco and I are still friends, right? <laughs> uh, I've worked in a lot of NGOs. This one is by the train train NGO trying to reestablish the railroad system in Lebanon. If ever they attack us, that means we're getting close to success, right? Uh, because there are a lot of people who don't want the trains to succeed. Well, the trains were working in parentheses. The trains were working to an extent in 1991, after the Civil War. Why were they closed down? The link between, between Tripoli and Aleppo is still functional. They just have to turn it on. If there would be a railroad link between Tripoli and Aleppo, who would lose? Beirut. So we don't want that, do we? If there's a, if there's a railroad link, then we don't need as many roads. And we don't need a lot of trucks. So let's close it down. Yes? OK. There are, there are per, continue the parentheses. There's the main railroad link going between Tripoli and Haifa, which was built in World War II by the Australians and the South Africans, British troops. There's the link between Rayak in the Baka and Homs, those two links are still working. The coastal link, uh, excuse me, the one between Tripoli and Aleppo is still working in the Rayak one. The one between Tripoli and uh, Haifa is not working, especially around Junia. It's all been built on. Uh, and then there's another one which goes from Beirut to Damascus. That was closed down in the, in the 60s. But there are two links that still work. 
The others would have to be, uh, just as background information, uh, would have to be completely built from scratch. But that's hopefully going to happen because the Gulf states are building a huge network with tens of billions of dollars linking the Gulf through Syria and Iraq, up through Turkey, more or less along the same logic as the gas pipelines, which are also coming through. And I think Lebanon is interested in that too. So Lebanon can be part of this or not. We'll see. Anyway, so one of the things, get back to NGOs, parentheses closed, when you're working in NGOs, a lot of people who work in NGOs are not really nice people. The problem with, NG <laughs> the problem with NGOs is there's no way of killing the dead wood, getting rid of the, the crap, if you will. If you're in, in business and you're a bad person and you're not successful, what's going to happen sooner or later? You're going to go bankrupt or you're going to get fired and you're gone. So in, in the commercial sector, there's a natural regulative, which is going bankrupt or being fired. In a democracy, democracies, in politics, if you're not doing a good job, what happens in democracies? You're not reelected and they kick you out. So in, in the government sector, the public sector, and the private sector, the, there are natural mechanisms to get rid of the people who are bad news. In the civil society sector, there's none. So all those bad people with bad vibes and they're mean and unsuccessful, they stay in their jobs to a large extent. And all the international funding flows in and they just keep on making problems. So same thing in, in Europe. When, my, when I was your age, I started experiencing some very ugly things. By the time I got into a more of a leadership position, I had experienced many negative things in civil society. So when the big things hit me, I was ready. Same thing goes for Franco Bonabe. Okay, so what's the second thing that kept him from giving up? The first thing is he was skilled in dealing with cognitive dissonance and with significant adversity because of his past. But what, as, as he was going through this, these horrible times, what kept him from saying, I've had enough and just giving up? Solitudine. Every day, sit down and step out of the pressures of the day before you start. Yes. Okay. But now let's get back to the actual concept of flow of success in your breeding. So please take them out. And since this is being recorded, I'll have to read it myself. Normally, I like someone in class to read. Turn to page 70 in the handwritten section. It's page 269 in your reader. Are you all, are you, have you all turned there? 70. OK. You all have it? Guys, just because you got an A does not mean you can talk in class. OK. As a group, he's talking about American students. They are highly motivated, talented, and bright. Most are graduates of the best secondary and undergraduate schools. Many of the American students upon graduation from college were recruited and subsequently trained by some of our most prestigious commercial and financial institutions, or by the military. Only a small percentage of them come from elite families. But as a group, they do come from predominantly, they do come predominantly from upwardly mobile middle class backgrounds. Our, our society seems to work for them. These are not people who are rich or come from the top elites of the country, but they have had, have had it good, have had, things have worked for them over the years. And I would say that a lot of students at NDU have probably gone to relatively good private schools. I doubt that anybody is a graduate of a public school. Uh, and once you graduate from the undergraduate program, unless you're in engineering, you can actually start working right away, uh, your degree from NDU will be seen as something valuable, which will give you an easy in to a nice job, either here in Lebanon or abroad. That's why parents send their kids to private schools. And as things continue to work for you, you have the expectation 
that it's always going to be that way. So, continue. From some angles of vision, these young adults obviously represent a certain sort of privilege. Yet this particular profile of young adults Success seems to have a number of implications that are sober, soberingly significant in terms of the student's potential as future managers and leaders. Signif spe specifically because they have been in the flow of success. The flow of success is a bad thing, if that's all you know. Obviously, when you work hard, you expect to be rewarded. But what if every time you do something, you succeed. In sports, that's a, that's a really bad thing. Imagine you're an athlete and every time you try out a new sport, you're good at it, you win. What are you going to expect? Everything's going to come my way. You're never going to be ready for that moment, which will always come, where it stops working. And if, that's your, and if you are in the flow of success, let's say in a business situation or in politics, and all of a sudden things stop working, what are you tempted to do? Yourself. Cheat. <laughs> Cheat. <laughs> what? It's not working all of a sudden? Oh, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to play. I'll make it work. <laughs> I'll make it work. I will not play by the rules because the rules so far were always working for me. Now they're not working for me. So instead of changing myself, I'll just ignore the rules and I'll break the rules. This is from an ethics and leadership perspective. Focus on this issue. From an ethical perspective, as long as the rules work for you, the normative, conventional approach is okay. You don't even need to internalize the conventions. It's just the way it is. And every, I'm happy. Yeah, all the rules, great. Post-conventional thinking kicks in when you are confronted with adversity. When you say, okay, I'm going to do the right thing even though I'm punished. This can happen. The best example, of course, uh, we know of is Nazi Germany. If Oh, did anybody see, uh, uh, I have a child, so I get to see lots of kiddie movies. Did anybody see Belle et Sebastian? When you were little? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great movie. I, I, it's the, new, the new version is out in the cinema. Go see it. It's a great movie. It's about French peasants taking who across the Alps into Switzerland. Who are they sneaking into Switzerland? You didn't remember that from a kid? Jews. The Nazis have occupied Swiss, uh, France. Jews are trying to escape into Switzerland. And they take them way up in the Alps to try to help them to escape the Nazis where they would be exterminated. So, nobody remembers that part of the? No. Nobody knows this movie? Nobody knows. It's a book, too. You didn't read it, right? You were you're already no dadas back in, in childhood? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> as a, anyway, what, what this movie shows is a high level of willingness to do the right thing even if... I mean, if they're doing the right thing by helping these people who are... Obviously, in a children's movie, some of the heroes have to be children. And the other heroes are animals, right? So we have Sebastian, who's like eight, and the dog. And then, of course, we have a little Jewish girl, right? So that's, you know, it's, it's not love, but they're too young, but, you know, it's already going in that direction. Uh, Sebastian and his friends in the small village, are they doing the right thing by not handing the Jews over to the Nazis? Or are they doing the wrong thing? From a, from a conventional perspective, they're doing the wrong thing, according to Kohlberg's categorization. According to rest, see now you can use these theories. According to rest, what are the, what's the conflict here between, between maintaining norms 
post-conventional and self-interest. It's in their self-interest to hand the Jews over to the Nazis. They might even get a reward. Maintaining norms would be to hand the Jews over to the Nazis. Post-conventional is to take them at your risk of your own life across the mountains into Switzerland. Now, why do people have those abilities to stand up against the rules? Because they've internalized, internalized the rules. So, what Linda Hill is showing us is that as long as you're in the flow of success, you will never be post-conventional. Now, please, guys, notice this. I saw this on the test. First of all, on the test, a lot of you wrote, instead of one page, you wrote one paragraph. There's no way you can use all the terms in the readings and show me that you know what you're talking about if all, is if all you wrote is one paragraph. If I, so a lot of you also said that Hammerskjold talked about post-conventional ethics. Did Hammerskjold talk about post-conventional ethics? No. But his concept, what, what concept of his is similar to post-conventional ethics? Maturity of mind. So when you write about Hammerskjold's concept of a highly developed ethical life, you don't say Hammerskjold wrote about post-conventional ethics. You say that Hammerskjold wrote about maturity of mind, which, according to Kohlberg or Rest, would be post-conventional ethics. Now, how do you achieve post-conventional ethics according to Linda Hill? Does Linda Hill mention this concept? No. But how do you achieve it? By significant adversity, by cross-cultural cognitive dissonance, getting out of the flow of success. Now we can start linking the different theories with each other. Now this is only possible, obviously, if one, you're reading your homework, and two, you're paying attention in class. So what we're establishing here is a method a practical method. This is called exercising moral courage. A pra practical steps now, based on the examples of actual moral leaders or ethical leaders of how to do this. So what she's saying is that a lot of us, and I'm sure a lot of the students in this class have, I hope a lot of students in this class have not had to really deal yet with the horrors of, of the real world. I mean, most parents don't want to take their kids at the age of 10 and say, I'm, I'm going to go out and expose you to horrible things so that you grow up quicker and you have a successful career. P p what do parents try to do? They try to shelter their children, to, to let them grow up in a state of security and feeling loved. Was that the case for the Lebanese who grew up during the Civil War? No. One of the reasons why your parents, most likely, this is what I hear at least, one of your reasons why your parents are spoiling you is bec because they didn't get spoiled when they were your age, right? I'm assuming that this very moment, a lot of Syrian parents are feeling very bad because they can't protect their children from all of the horrible things that they're being exposed to. They feel guilty. They say, I, I, don't, I don't think a parent is, is doing the right thing if it's, it's allowing its children, their children, to have, have to go through this. Can they do anything about it? No. no, just like the Lebanese parents couldn't do anything about it 30 years ago. So we can probably assume that in 20 years, these kids, when they grow up, they're going to spoil their kids rotten. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing for the kids to be spoiled by their parents? It's a bad thing, according to Linda Hill, at least. By the way, get used to this. When you're saying it's a bad thing, Argue it with theory. So when you say it's a bad thing, say it's a bad thing according to Linda Hill because of the flow of success. Bravo. The flow of success. Get used to doing this. Guys, the second, the second exam is worth 10. Second quiz test is worth 10%. The third one? 15. Yeah, OK. So it goes up. OK. So let's move on to the next page. Uh, wait a second, where is it? Uh, no, it's here. Okay, flow of success. Right, okay, I'll continue where I left off. Most are fully capable of critical thought 
and can work out a strategy within a given set of conditions. What does that mean, guys? If you're, if they're good, they're well educated. Within a situation that they're used to, they can figure things out. They can get good grades. They can be successful. Where are they going to be challenged? When they're thrown out of the things that they're used to. But continue. But in the absence of, guys, this is like, you know, underline this. This is going to be on the test for sure. In the absence of significant adversity and cross-cultural cognitive dissonance, they have had less experience than have some of their generational peers in recognizing and considering the conditions themselves, the broader social, cultural, political, and economic context within which conditions themselves, are, or the conditions themselves rest. When you are in the flow of success, you don't question, according to Hill, the situation you're in. It's working to your benefit. You, you swim with the current. Why do people who are experiencing adversity question the situation? Why do women tend to be, in, according to rest, tend to be more post-conventional than men? Because the rules are set up to benefit men and discriminate against women. Why are minorities? Same thing. Why are people in Eastern Europe more likely to be post-conventional? Because they grew up in communism, which was highly corrupt. And I would argue that it's probably the same thing in Lebanon. I, I don't think there's very many people in Lebanon who say, oh, the way things are running right now, that's great. Unless they're really, really rich and they're just, all the money's just flowing into their pocket. But most of us are not really happy. Last night, my UPS broke. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, I put it on Facebook. I, have, <laughs> I said, camping in Lebanon. I had the entire apartment full of candles, right? <laughs> the UPS broke. Huh? Yeah, no electricity. The electricity went off, and then I, the, the, the UPS went on. Beep, beep, beep. Poof. There you go. Now we have to wait till 12, OK, <laughs> for the electricity to come back. So. No, I don't live in Beirut, unfortunately. Yeah, that's three hours, I know. OK, so if you grow up in a situation where you assume that the rules are bad, you will constantly be questioning them. This is what he's saying. It's adversity that forces us to do this. But let's get back now to cross-cultural cognitive dissonance. What do Lebanese have in common with Franco Bernabe? Every Lebanese. They, they experience conflicting cultural norms. You grow up as, with, with the situation where what other people do is unacceptable to you, in many cases. And what do you do about it? Nothing. Nothing. You live with it. This is the way things are. Guys, this is the way the world is. What is the largest steel company in the world? Tata. Tata. It's Indian. Tata, like a lot of other large Indian corporations, I was just at a conference last November in India on ethics and business in India, run by Indians, on ethics and business. The, the Indians are actually challenged with the same problems that the Lebanese are, except the big difference is that the Indians are doing something about it. One of the reasons they have to do something about it is because they're incredibly successful. And when you're incredibly successful as an Indian corporation, you don't put as much money into R&D as Europeans do. What's R&D? Research, Research and development. What do you do with all, that, with all those billions of dollars? You buy European companies and take their technology. Is that smart? Yeah. Especially now, a lot of European companies are struggling. They can't make a profit, so they're what we call low-hanging fruit, right? When you walk in, in, through an apple orchard, you pick the apples that are low-hanging. So a lot, of, a lot of European companies, North American companies, are being bought for very low prices, and they have a lot of technology. The Indians are now taking over French metal, uh, steel companies. Now, is the culture in France different than the culture in India? Yes. You better believe it. So what do the Indians have to do if they don't want to drive their French companies into the ground? 
they have to be culturally flexible. So cross-cultural cognitive dissonance is a prerequisite. Now the good thing for you guys is you don't have to learn this. Because you grew up this way. So at least that one is taken care of, right? This is, by the way, my experience. I've gone, I've gone uh, on trips with Lebanese a lot to Europe. And what I notice is the Lebanese are always the best. And whatever. At conferences and presentations, they're always the best. Because Lebanese are very good at figuring out what's going on immediately. Why are they so good at figuring things out? The first time I went, it was in 2003 with my students to Germany. I had students in the graduating class and the, uh, you have this in your programs as well. It's the senior class. It's the capstone class. I took them to Germany. They were together with master's students at the University of Frankfurt, and they were undergraduates, and they were better. And, my prof and the professors, the German professors, they said, your students are amazing. I said, these are not my students. My students are not like this. The body snatchers must have got my students. I've never seen them act this way. <laughs> it was the first time I saw it, and then it happened every single time. What are Lebanese good at when they go abroad? Figuring it out. And, and immediately they switch, they figure out what the code is, and they do 10% better. And everybody goes, wow, that's amazing. OK, that is the advantage of growing up with co cross-cultural cognitive dissonance. The disadvantage of that is, by the way, that if you're really good like that, a lot of students think, well, you know, that's uh, great. I don't have to do any work. <laughs> I'll just figure it out because I'm Lebanese, right? Uh, that works for like you know, a month or two, and then it stops working. Right? Uh, but that is also, some, in some way, a flow of success. You have the skills without having to work for them. OK. Let's look at another example in the reading, which is South Africa. South Africa is, in many ways, very similar to Lebanon. Who knows anything about South Africa? We've talked about South Africa before. Okay. The, are the conflicts about race? Is the root of the conflict race? It's power linked to resources. What is South Africa famous for besides rugby? Diamonds, gold, and platinum. And agriculture. But diamonds, gold, and platinum, kind of interesting commodities, right? They have a huge amount of natural resources which are very, very valuable. They also have agriculture. They're also famous for their sports teams, rugby especially. And Cricket, yes, uh, if you're into that. Uh, anyway, South Africa has a conflict to this very day based on resource distribution. What happened was that South Africa was settled by Dutch. It was then conquered by the British. At the top of the, of the, of the pile were the British. Right below them were the Dutch. At the bottom were the Africans. And in between were the so-called coloreds. We talked about this before. Where were the Lebanese originally? The coloreds, coloreds as, as Ottomans, as Turks. So the real conflict is about resources. The distinction used is race, skin color. In Lebanon, if you go back 200 years, 300 years, was the conflict about religion. Yeah? The Ottomans were, what were they doing here? It was about power. It was the Ottoman Empire taking over from the Arab Empire. One of the best ways to keep people under control is to use language, skin color, or religion to cover up power relationships about resources and money. So the, 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 the struggle, the conflict, the war, if you will, and the shuf in the mid-1800s, what was it about? Who was, who was, who was fighting? Maronites. Druze and Maronites. Was it about religion? No. Who was working for whom? 
The Christians were working for the Druze. One of the core, my limited Lebanese historical knowledge, one of the core industries at the time was silk. At that time, the silk industry was collapsing. So, what do workers do when they lose their jobs? Complain. What do bosses tend to do when workers complain? Give them what they want. No. Suppress them. So you could argue that the conflict was actually between employers and employees, but it was sold, it was reported as a conflict between religions. So keep this in mind when we look at South Africa, because the situation in South Africa has not improved that much. What we saw in South Africa was a conflict between three groups, two European colonial powers and the indigenous population. Indigenous, the people who were from there. The British versus the Dutch. The British obviously have a much larger empire. They defeat the Dutch. They take over South Africa. The Dutch are very unhappy about this. And what happens in the, eight, in the 1950s is South Africa becomes independent. They have free elections. The majority of the white population is Dutch. Guess who wins the elections? The Dutch. And now they undo what the British have done, namely putting Dutch on the second position and they want to be top. Who do they take it out on? The British? No, the blacks. And they try to increase their wealth, not at the expense of the British, because that's not going to work, but at the expense of the blacks. So apartheid is really about a redistribution of wealth and not really about race. It's not about pigmentation. What we see today in South Africa is there's no racism. But almost everybody who's poor is black. What you see now is a lot of blacks entering the elites. A lot of blacks are, are very successful in business. Obviously, the blacks are successful in the government because they have the majority. The ANC, the Af African National Congress, is a party that's, they have elections coming up. They'll be, uh, I think, next week. We'll, we'll see the results. The Af African National Congress has been in power for 20 years, and they can't be defeated. What does that lead to? High levels of corruption. The African National Congress is a very, very corrupt organization. Now, what, can, what will prevent you, as a member of the Af African National Congress, from just saying, wow, we're in power now. Let's just steal all the government resources. What can you do to protect yourself if you want to remain honest, according to Hill? What will what, allow you to remain an honest? What will give you moral courage? She gives two examples of, of leaders in the article. The people who went through apartheid, were they confronted with cross-cultural cognitive dissonance? Of course. And of course, significant adversity. OK, enough for the lecture for today. I unfortunately did not have time to have a pop quiz. Wait. What I want you to do for next Tuesday are two things. One, finish reading the article, which was assigned for today. And two is to start working on your papers. Now, wait, have a seat. We have now covered all of the theories except the last one. The last one is only relevant for those of you who are dealing with international leaders. Is anybody dealing with a leader on the international level? Some, for example, someone like Dag Hammarskjöld. Has anybody chosen an inter a global leader? A thought of, you didn't choose anybody. Nobody thinking about it. OK. So what I would like you to do, last point, now, and I will put this on Blackboard and Facebook, but I would like you for Thursday, believe me, I'm online. If you haven't noticed, I do use the internet. Uh, for Thursday, I would like you to come up with two ideas for a paper, two. 
one of them will be the one that you'll then choose for your paper. Okay, we talked about this at the beginning of the semester. What goes into the paper? Yes, but I'm going to just go over it right now before everybody gets up. Have a seat, guys. One, they have to be real cases. Some of you made a, didn't do very good in the, in the essays and in the, in the uh, exams because real life examples mean real life examples, not what if. A real case. Two, two real cases. You have to have one of the conflicts in the paradigms. Is that clear? I just want to make sure it's clear. It has to be in your major. Don't say I'm a finance major, there are no ethical issues in finance. Or I'm in nutrition, there's no ethical issues in nutrition, there are. So, one, real cases, two of them. Two, a good, good conflict, a good, good dilemma. Three, from your major, and it has to be based on a theory. I want you to think now which theory you're going to use. We've, we've had now all of them except Dirk, uh, Kirk Hansen. If, you, if you're thinking about doing somebody on the international level, the Kirk Hansen article is very short. It's only eight, seven pages. So the theory has to now be put into it. I want you to think which theory fits. That's due for Thursday. I will upload that on Blackboard and Facebook this evening. Okay. See you on Tuesday.